First Timothy for Beginners, uh, lesson number 12. Uh, Paul's teaching on slavery. Just two verses, but I thought it would be worth uh, kind of drilling down a little bit on this uh, particular topic. Uh, as far as the lesson is concerned, we're in the last chapter of Paul's letter to Timothy. Uh, and it contains teaching and specific instructions covering a wide range of topics. Uh, initial instruction to guard a good doctrine and maintain his ministry. Teaching on the roles of men and women in public worship assemblies. Profiles of the type of men to serve as elders and deacons and the qualities that wives of these men should possess. A lot of things, he talks about a lot of things in this chapter. Uh, the warning about apostasy, uh, guidelines for ministers' work and conduct, instructions on how to conduct a benevolence program for widows in the church. Apparently that was a, a big problem in the, in the church at the, in the first century. Not necessarily a problem, but a, a challenge, let's put it that way. And also teaching on the church's proper attitude towards elders and the manner of correcting them when necessary. So you know, we've gone over all of this, but he's talked about all of these things in this, uh, in this uh, section. The final chapter uh, will continue to deal with various church issues that may have previously been raised by Timothy, or that Paul was in some way aware of uh, having spent several years in that church himself. Between say 54 and 57 AD, he had been where uh, Timothy was. Um, in uh, chapter uh, six, verses one and two, he's going to talk about the master-slave relationship. So we'll read verse one. It says, all who are under the yoke as slaves are to regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and our doctrine will not be spoken against. Those who have uh, believers as their masters must not be disrespectful to them because they are brethren, but must serve them all the more because those who partake of the benefit are believers and beloved. Teach and preach these principles. So there are a lot of people that accuse the Christianity of promoting slavery because as we see here, Paul does not denounce the evil of slavery. <laughs> you notice he's giving instructions to the slave and he's also giving instruction to the master and he doesn't make any ne negative comments about the slaves and, and masters. And obviously he's talking to people who were believers who held slaves. And so there's often uh, you know, an, a, an attack or a, an argument made against Christianity. Why well, you guys, you, know, you, you condone slavery. Well, it's, uh, Paul even talks about it here. So um, let's review some information about slavery in the ancient world and uh, as it was practiced in Old Testament times among the Jews as well as the New Testament period. So in the Old Testament uh, times among pagan nations as well as among Jews there were many ways that a person became a slave. For example, the most common were those who were enslaved as the result of war. You know, the losers of the war became the slaves of the victors. Uh, you hear that often, uh, even when uh, uh, David is uh, facing Goliath. What's the deal that Goliath says? You know, send out one of your men to fight me. You know? If he wins, we'll become your slaves. If I win, you'll become our slaves. I mean, that's the way, you know, that's the way it operated in those days. Uh, others were sold into slavery by their family or their nation. We read about that in Genesis 17, verse 12. Uh, many were born into slavery. Their parents were slaves, their grandparents were slaves. Genesis 15, 13. At times, a person beca uh, became a slave in order to make restitution for a crime. Uh, there were no formal prisons in those days and um, um, uh, no, uh, no penitentiaries, nothing like that. And so slavery was a form of punishment. Exodus 22, verse three. Um, uh, slavery was also the result when someone defrauded on debts. Uh, in England, for example, uh, 17th, 18th century, if, if you couldn't pay your bill, you went to debtor's prison. Kind of the same thing here. Uh, there was also self-sale into slavery in order to escape poverty or destitution. And then, of course, kidnapping and piracy were criminal forms of slavery 
but were not permitted among the Jews. This type of uh, slavery was not permitted, Exodus 21, 16. So, when discussing uh, slavery in the Old Testament, you must differentiate between how it was practiced among the pagans and how it was practiced among the Jews. Among the pagans, like the Greeks or the Romans, slavery was commerce, was a business. Slaves in ancient times uh, were not considered human. They were property to be bought and sold. Slavery also existed among the Jews, but was tempered and regulated by law. For example, a Jew could not hold another Jew in permanent slavery because of debt or self-sale. Jewish slaves had to be released um, at the year of Jubilee and uh, have their property restored to them uh, at the year of Jubilee. So every six years there was um, uh, something called a sabbatical year, like the seventh year was a sabbatical year, where they gave uh, their land a rest, no farming on the land, Leviticus uh, 25 verse two. And then after seven cycles of sabbatical years, you know, seven times seven, 49, on the 50th year they uh, uh, re, uh, gave back, if you wish, excuse me, uh, on the 50th year was called the year of uh, uh, Jubilee. They celebrated the year of Jubilee. Um, that term Jubilee comes from the Hebrew word horn, the horn, referring to a ram's horn or a trumpet. You know, uh, send the news out, the good news, you know, Jubilee. Um, on the year of Jubilee, all debts were forgiven, Jewish slaves were freed, and land that had been sold reverted back to the original owners. It was how they determined the value of land and debts in those days, how close or far the contract was made to the year of Jubilee. So if you bought a piece of land you know, and you were still uh, 44 years from Jubilee, uh, you paid a lot more money for that land, obviously, because you could use it for a long time before the year of Jubilee. If you bought the land in the 40, you know, 46 years, like two years or three years to go uh, for the year of Jubilee, obviously the land was worth much less because you had less time to work it and to, you know, to get a, a profit. Okay? Now the point of this law was to remind the Jews that they did not own the land or they didn't own the slaves. Everything belonged to God. It also guaranteed that the original borders for each tribe would remain it remained the same and no tribe would increase by commercial trade or uh, other. The borders of each tribe were established by Joshua when they went into the land and through the system of, of Jubilee, you know, giving back the land that they had purchased or borrowed or whatever, they made sure that each tribe maintained their original tribal land that were originally given to them and you know, chartered out uh, by Joshua. Now, among the Jews, there were also other laws which protected female slaves and families from abuse. Obviously, having female slaves uh, among pagans uh, was a situation ripe for uh, all kinds of uh, abuse. But among the Jews, for example, if a female slave married her master or her master's son, she would be set free. Or if her master did not provide for her or divorced her, she would also then be free. Uh, he couldn't marry her and then reject her and divorce her and she still remained his slave. He had to set her free, that was the law. Exodus 21, seven to 11. Um, even foreign slaves purchased or captured in war were included in the covenant through circumcision and participation in the festival and feast days. Exodus 12, verse 44. Now, Slavery did not exist among the Jews of the Old Testament, but it was not the basis of their, excuse me, it did exist among the Jews of the Old Testament, but it was not the basis of their economy or their military. It was practiced in a more humane way among the Jews where there were laws protecting the treatment of slaves. For example, it was against the law to kill a slave. Unlike in the pagan world, you could kill a slave and you know, there would be no, no repercussions other than economic ones. You lost the value of that slave, but there was no law punishing you for that. That was not the case among the Jews. So we have to judge them in the light of the degree of enlightenment that they had at that time. 
What they did, slavery, was morally wrong according to the knowledge and the revelation that we have today in the teachings of Christ. But for that period and according to their understanding, they weren't sinning. There was no guilt involved on their part for uh, having slaves. All right, so that's a little bit of uh, information about slavery in the Old Testament, uh, how it, it existed among uh, the Greeks and the, the Romans and the Gentiles. Take a look at uh, what the New Testament says about this. Uh, by New Testament times, attitudes about slavery were changing drastically, but there were still differences between Jewish and Gentile practices. Estimates of the total number of slaves in the Roman Empire say that as many as one third of the population in the Roman Empire were slaves. Now we have to be careful uh, in the way we see the slavery of that time. Although morally wrong, the slavery of the Roman Empire was not the same as the slavery of the 18th and 19th century, uh, the slave trade that existed uh, here in the United States. The United States, uh, the American slave, if you wish, was the uh, 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 economic backbone of the southern states at that time. They didn't want to give up slavery, not so much as a moral issue during the Civil War, it was economic. It would, it, would, it would destroy their, their economic system uh, as it existed at that time. Um, uh, uh, the, the US slave also was not considered human, uh, below human status, uh, even when they uh, received the emancipation. What was the, the, they were considered what? A third? No, two thirds, two thirds human so that their vote would not override the vote of a, a white person. So you know, the, the enlightenment and the, you know, the, the equality came very, very slowly. Uh, let's see, uh, in the first century, uh, there was relative peace, and so there were fewer slaves from war and kidnapping during the Pax Romana, that 100 years of, of relative quiet in the Roman uh, Empire. Uh, most slaves were domestic slaves or those who had become slaves through indebtedness. Slaves were not the basis of the economy, but they were contributors to the economy. Uh, at this period of time, owning slaves was a mark of prestige and wealth. Slaves learned trades, usually the same trade as their masters, uh, and they worked side by side with them, sharing in the prosperity. There was a hierarchy of slaves according to experience and training, and some were responsible for managing other slaves, even running their own businesses under their, ma uh, their master's patronage. So it was a much different you know, system than uh, we read about the slavery in this country uh, several hundred years ago. Now in the Roman Empire, there was a movement towards granting more slaves their freedom Manumission, it was called. Uh, Paul the Apostle said uh, he had been born a free man. This was a gift that Rome had bestowed on the province of Cilicia and the major city of Tarsus uh, by Pompeii uh, in 64 uh, BC. Uh, it was given probably for cooperation of the people with the government. I think the deal was if, if you save us the war and the trouble of going in and conquering you and submitting you, if you save us that trouble and come into our orbit of power and pay taxes to us and save us the trouble of a war, we will grant you Roman citizenship. So they, they made the deal and, and so the people of that province, Cilicia, specifically the town of Tarsus, where Paul the Apostle was born. That's why Paul said, you know, he's a free man. He's a, he was a Roman citizen. How did he get it? Well, he, he got it because he was a citizen of Tarsus uh, when Tarsus received that, um, uh, that privilege. Uh, records of the time show that society was slowly recognizing that slavery was not a good economic and social model, and this pushed a trend to allow freedom to more and more slaves. As a matter of fact, the Roman government had to put limits on how rapidly foreign slaves were freed into Roman society for fear of diluting the citizenry class of Rome. 
They were afraid of an economic breakdown if too many slaves became citizens at the same time. They had to do it, you know, it, it, it upended the social norms too quickly. They had to go more slowly. Um, so let's look at uh, slavery in the first century, this time a little more focused, you know, zoom in a little bit. In the first century church, because we know it existed, right? None of the apostles were slaves, we know that, or had slaves. The most common form of slavery in Judah at the time were household slaves. Note that Jesus acknowledges but does not condemn the existence of this system in many of his teachings and parables. Isn't that amazing? You have Jesus himself, I mean, <laughs> if there was anyone who could speak to that issue, it was him, and yet, no, nothing. We have nothing in the New Testament about him specifically speaking about the evil of uh, slavery. Uh, it was a social reality in that time but it did not cause social unrest. You need to remember that. Okay. Uh, it was part of a system that no one questioned because the people did not have the, quote, Western mindset that we have inherited over two millennia of social change and progress. You can't, you can't uh, transfer your mind, our mindset today to the mindset of a first century Christian about this issue. I mean, you know, we've, We've gone through too many things, too many changes. Uh, we've inherited so many ideas from so many people that they did not have at that time. Once the gospel was preached to the Gentiles, uh, there were established, uh, at first, mixed churches with Jews and Gentiles, but then mixed churches with slave and free, even masters and slaves within the same household were part of the same congregation. You know, what about the jailer's household? You know, the jailer uh, in Philippi where Paul and, uh, was imprisoned and you know, there was the earthquake and, so, and, you know, and, and uh, he was going to kill himself because he thought all his prisoners had run away. Uh, and Paul tells him, no, don't do that. You know? and, and he asked, uh, what, what do I need to do to be saved? And you know, Paul preaches the gospel. And what does he say? He, he baptized him and his household. What are his household? Well, the slaves in his household, his family, his wife, his children, but the slaves uh, included in that, in that group. What about Lydia's household? Who are those people, Lydia's household? Well, they included slaves. So uh, now that the uh, uh, gospel was brought uh, to the Jews and Gentiles, also to the slaves and those who were free, the question arises, why wasn't slavery, slavery expressly denounced by the apostles? Why, they didn't, why didn't they do it? A couple of reasons. Number one, as a social system, it was already passing away. It was already on its way out. Paul teaches from a positive perspective, encouraging how slaves and masters should relate to one another to promote peace and harmony. He talks about it in 1 Corinthians 7, Ephesians 6, Colossians 3. Apostles were sent to preach the gospel of salvation to all people, slave and free, not to promote social reform for a system that was already in decline. That was not their message. That was not their plan. That was not their mission. Had they done that, had they taken up the mantle of free the slaves and started some kind of social revolution, they would have never had the opportunity to preach the gospel. They might have been able to preach it to those who were slaves, but they surely would not have been able to preach it to those who were free, to the masters. Secondly, this is very pragmatic, there was nothing to replace it. I mean, you know, what are they going to replace it with? At the time, there was no great middle class to absorb newly freed slaves with jobs, money, land, opportunity, training. I believe, and I'm, you know, forgive me, I'm, I'm not a, a student of American history. When I grew up, obviously in Canada, we studied Canadian history. But I know enough about this issue here that uh, uh, apparently many uh, slaves, you know, when the emancipation occurred, many slaves chose to stay where they were. 
Again, it was purely a pragmatic decision. Okay, I'm free, what do I, where do I go? <laughs> what do I do? Who, who, you know, I have no money to buy a house. I have no, you know what I'm saying? Uh, the freedom was marvelous, but uh, society had not caught up to the concept yet. Well, it was kind of the same idea here. There was nothing to replace it. This system, although not morally ideal, did provide stability for the poor, as well as social peace. In Philemon, uh, verse 16, Paul sends a runaway slave that he had converted. He sends this runaway slave back to his master, but he doesn't demand that he be set free, he doesn't demand it. Without money or family, he would have to you know, enslave himself all over again to somebody else in order to survive. Now he does, you know, he, he, he asks it as a favor to himself, of course. But his arguments are about interpersonal love and what is the right thing to do. He's not preaching about changing the whole, he's not preaching about changing the whole society. His letter to Philemon you know, is, is a personal thing between him and that particular master and that particular slave. Of course, in that letter, um, uh, you find the ideal way to deal with this issue. Okay. So uh, in those days, obviously, no unemployment insurance, no job training, no welfare. As a matter of fact, domestic slavery was a kind of welfare for that time period. If you had no specific skills, if you didn't come from a family that had uh, some money or uh, some sort of business or service, I mean, you, were, you didn't have a lot of options. The Roman army was very specific. Who, they didn't just you know, pick up anybody uh, to be in the Roman army. You, you had to be a Roman and so on and so forth. And then we understand that slavery was only temporary. For Christians, their status was changed by their conversion, not their social status. You know, masters became slaves to God, slaves became free in Christ, everyone was equal in Jesus. Galatians 3, 26, we are all in one. Life on earth is temporary, so whatever position you hold on earth is going to end in death anyways. In 1 Corinthians 7, you know, Paul talks about freedom in Christ. It doesn't change your social status. Now, if you're able to change your status, he says, go ahead. But even if you do, it's temporary anyways. If you're a slave and you're able to buy your freedom or to get your freedom, Paul says, go ahead and get it, it's great. But you're going to live as a free man for a few more years and then you're going to die. You know? So don't put all your hope in your social status. What's important is your station on, uh, or your position with God. And so with conversion comes many new positions and titles. For example, your new identity in Christ. What is it made of? Well, you're a disciple, a priest. First Peter talks about that. You belong to the household of God. You're a saved individual a son or daughter of God, beloved in Christ, all these things. You take on a brand new identity made up of many parts. And so whether you're a slave or, or free has no effect on you know, the identity you take on as a Christian, that Paul argues. So the point is that as Christians, we all take on a new identity and position before God in eternity. So whatever or whoever we are here, male, female, slave, free, rich, poor, whatever, has so little bearing on the final outcome of who we are in Christ. These terms no longer define us. They only describe our earthly status and only for a time. Whether we're rich or poor or free or slave, that's only for a time. Paul and the other apostles knew this and also knew that the social order of the day was passing away to be replaced with something else, something better. They did not denounce it, they simply guided masters and slaves how to live 
in peace and in love with one another in the world that they found themselves a part of. That was the hard part. Could you imagine, you're a master and you have this slave and both of you believe in Jesus and both of you are buried into Christ and now you're brothers in Christ. How, how, do, you, how do you deal with that situation? That was the problem. That's what Paul is writing about. That's what he's kind of teaching uh, in, these, uh, in these letters. And so the role of apostles and preachers and the church is not to dismantle the existing world order, whatever it is. Whether the world order is totalitarianism or communism or capitalism or multiculturalism, those are the things that human beings figure out. Those are not the things that we promote. We're here to promote the kingdom of God on earth. That's the only system that we're here to promote. Thankfully, in this country, we, we have freedom, a measure, a great measure of freedom. And so that means we're free to pursue our, our work here as Christians you know, more easily, more um, enthusiastically. Someone said to me once, yeah, well, what would happen? Boy, the socialists take over and then we're under communism and it's big brother and everybody's controlling. What would you do? And I said, well, I'd do the same thing I'm doing now. <laughs> I'd have more trouble doing it. I might get shot because of it, but it would not change my job description in any way. And it wouldn't change your, quote, spiritual job description in any way either. Our task is to build a kingdom of God within whatever world order we find ourselves in. That's our task. We witness to the existing world that there is an unseen world that is coming and everyone needs to be prepared for that unseen world. In the end, the heavens and earth and all that is in it will be destroyed anyway. Second Peter chapter three, verse 10. I mean, so I, I'm, I'm trying not to be too invested in what's here. My emotional and spiritual investment is in the kingdom. I just consider myself quite blessed that uh, our family is able to live in freedom and prosperity. That is a marvelous blessing. However, to whom much is given, much will be required. We have to remember that part too. It's okay to say thank you God for blessing us so richly and then enjoy our prosperity without guilt. That's okay. But let's remember that it isn't a free ride. There's a cost for us as well. So the only thing to survive will be the kingdom of God or the church, where all are free and all are gladly servants of Christ. That's the only thing going to survive. All right, that's, uh, I, I, I only wanted to take, uh, you know, just those two verses there, just wanted to talk about that and not rush through it. Uh, we'll continue, what are we in 12? We've got one more lesson to, uh, to wrap, up this, uh, wrap up this class. Thank you for your attention.